Welcome to the 14th Annual Symposium on St. Thomas Aquinas, sponsored by the Joyce McMahon Hank Aquinas Chair in Catholic Theology. One of the two endowed chairs at St. Mary's dedicated to St. Thomas and made possible through the generosity of Joyce McMahon Hank, St. Mary's class of 1952, a generous benefactor of the college and an emeritus member of its board of trustees. My name is Joseph Incandela and I hold the Aquinas Chair in Religious Studies as well as serve as Associate Dean of Faculty at St. Mary's and I'm delighted to introduce our featured speaker tonight. There are few Catholic theologians in the world for whom the phrases recognize authority in the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas and multimedia star <laughs> could appear in the same sentence. One is here this evening. Indeed, it may well be the case that the only one is here this evening. Robert Barron is a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago and professor of systematic theology at the University of St. Mary of the Lake, Mundelein Seminary, where he holds the Francis Cardinal George Chair of Faith and Culture. When Pope John Paul II spoke of the new evangelization as evangelization that can be new in its ardor, methods, and expression, he surely had someone like Father Barron in mind. The fruits of his study in the service of the gospel may be found not only in lectures delivered around the world and in the several books he has authored, including Thomas Aquinas' Spiritual Master, which received the Catholic Press Association First Prize in Spirituality, but also in Word on Fire Catholic Ministries, a nonprofit global media organization which he directs. In his YouTube video commentaries and movie reviews, in podcasts, in CDs, DVDs, on commercial and satellite radio, on television, both the, as the host of his own syndicated show on WGN, as a guide in the forthcoming 10 part series for TV and DVD entitled Catholicism, a project which took him all around the world to 30 locations in 16 countries to explore the richness, vitality, and living culture of the church. And even, and this will be new for the college students in the audience, on something called Facebook. <laughs> In his use of contemporary modes of communication to spread the gospel message, Father Barron has been favorably compared to Archbishop Fulton Sheen and his pioneering use of television in the 1950s. Just as Archbishop Sheen, Father Barron skillfully and gracefully marshals art, architecture, literature, movies, pop music, and all the stirrings of culture in the service of the gospel message. Theology for him is a way of seeing the world and the task of the theologian is to present that changed vision, that metanoia, to both believers and unbelievers. In any of the media and venues in which he appears, Father Barron radiates a joy in the theological enterprise. Joy, he has said, is a sure sign that God is alive in us. He is frequently struck and invites us to be so as well with the creator God of limitless surprises. Uncanny is a word that comes easily to his lips. That he finds this God thoroughly woven through the writings of Thomas Aquinas, a saint he has called his personal hero, is one of the things that brings him here tonight. Cardinal George has said of Father Barron that, quote, his is a theology that reaches back for its sources and forward for its concerns. Close quote. We look forward to being part of that journey this evening. Father Barron has been on our campus before, and so I'm delighted to welcome him back to St. Mary's. After his remarks, he has graciously agreed for some dialogue with your questions, and then we'll adjourn for a reception in the back of the room. The title of the talk is Thomas Aquinas and Why the Atheists Are Right. Please join me in welcoming Father <coughs> Robert Barron. So thank you very much for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, it's always with joy I come back to this part of the world. Uh, I was a freshman at Notre Dame in 1977, 78, and uh, spent a wonderful year there before entering the seminary. 
But I came back here in 2002. I was a, a visiting scholar at the university and taught a course and lived at Moreau Seminary, where I made lots of great friends among the Holy Cross. As Joe mentioned, I was back here at St. Mary's almost 10 years ago or so, maybe longer, for this uh, lecture. So it's always with joy and a sense of homecoming that I, uh, I come here. So thanks uh, for having me. Uh, the title, as you can guess, was meant to be provocative. Uh, Thomas Aquinas and Why the Atheists Are Right. Let me try to uh, explicate that now in the course of this talk. The great English Dominican theologian Herbert McCain engaged a number of atheists in the course of his career as a public intellectual. He would allow his interlocutor to make his opening statement detailing precisely why he didn't believe in God. And McCain would typically respond, I completely agree with you. The Anglican New Testament scholar N.T. Wright tells of an encounter he had with a young undergraduate when Wright was chaplain at Oxford. The freshman said, Father, don't expect to see a lot of me. I just don't believe in God. Wright asked him what he meant by God, and upon hearing the account, he responded, Son, I can assure you, I don't believe in that God either. Like McCabe and Wright, I've always found atheists of all stripes helpful, both spiritually and theologically, precisely in the measure that they clarify what the true God is not. They expose and implicitly undermine new forms of idolatry. One of the clearest in this regard is the father of modern atheism, Ludwig Feuerbach, who famously held that God is a projection of human idealized self-understanding, which is to say, a simulacrum of God made in the image of human beings, exactly what the Bible would have called an idol. Now, the only thing particularly new about the new atheism is its nastiness. Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, whom Paul Griffiths, by the way, deliciously combined as Ditchkins, <laughs> Sam Harris, Daniel Zanet, and their numerous disciples have borrowed many of the intellectual insights of Feuerbach, Marx, Freud, Sartre, Nietzsche, and company. What they've added is a dismissive contempt for religion and religious people. Whereas when you read Nietzsche and Sartre, you always have the impression that they were in battle with a pretty serious opponent. Ditchkins and company imply that they are exposing the delusions of an idiot child. And that's the major difference. Nevertheless, they serve, I think, for our generation, their essentially prophetic function of displaying idolatry. And this is continually needed because, as St. John of the Cross said, the mind is an idol-making machine. That's why we always need the atheist to keep exposing idolatry. First uh, specification now, what I'm calling the competitive god of the new atheists. There's so much we could say about the ruminations of these new atheists, so many ways we can engage them. Their obsession with biblical literalism, their deep concern about religion in relation to violence, their conviction that religion is irreconcilable with modern science, their conviction that faith poisons the minds of the young, etc. But I want to draw attention to one theme that I take to be basic, one misunderstanding that conditions everything else they discuss, namely the view that God is a being among many. One cause amidst the range of contingent causes. A reality in the world whose existence or non-existence can be determined through rational, which means for them scientific, investigation. As you know, Christopher Hitchens delights in recounting the famous tale of the encounter between the Emperor Napoleon and the French scientist Pierre Simon de Laplace, the author of The Celestial Mechanics. Having heard Laplace's exposition on the movement of the planets within the solar system, Napoleon reportedly asked why the figure of God did not appear in Laplace's schema, to which the scientist laconically responded, Je n'ai pas besoin de cette hypothèse. I don't need that hypothesis. Now, the assumption of both Napoleon and Laplace was apparently that God is rightly construed as one of the mechanical causes that contributes to the motion of the planets. Perhaps the largest and most important cause, but still one cause among many. Though Napoleon seemed to favor the existence of such a cause and Laplace to deny it, both thought of God as fundamentally like otherworldly agents. Now, we find something very similar in Richard Dawkins, the God delusion. Dismissing Stephen Jay Gould's position that religion and science deal with qualitatively different dimensions of reality. Gould calls it noma, non-overlapping magisteria. 
Dawkins opines that science can and must adjudicate the question of God's existence. Turning over to the chaplain, certain cosmological questions that seem to pass beyond the province of the sciences makes as much sense as, quote, turning them over to the chef or the gardener. That's uh, uh, Dawkins. Now here's how Dawkins characterizes the religious position, quote, the God hypothesis suggests that the reality we inhabit also contains a supernatural agent who designed the universe and even intervenes in it with miracles. That's a really clear presentation of the position of the new atheists. And this is precisely why Dawkins can compare belief in God to belief in, to use his famous phrase, the flying spaghetti monster. Um, I never knew that phrase until I did my YouTube videos on God, and I, I get all these responses about the flying spaghetti monster. What is the flying spaghetti monster? Well, it comes from Dawkins. Here's what he means. This fantastical imaginary being for whom there's not a trace of physical evidence. God is as likely as the flying spaghetti monster. Now here he's simply mimicking his master, Bertrand Russell, who speculated that it's as impossible to prove the non-existence of God as to demonstrate the non-existence of a china teapot ordering the sun between the earth and Mars. Now see, here's what I want you to see. What's so telling about both analogies, again, is that God is being compared to some agent or entity within the universe and operating alongside of other agents and entities. Dawkins concludes on the basis of this understanding of the divine that God's non-existence can be demonstrated to a very high degree of probability. If Occam's great principle, Occam's razor, holds, then God is not required since we can explain most, if not all, worldly phenomena by appealing to worldly causes. Genet Pathos wanted to set for Bodez, right? We have no need of this hypothesis of God. This way of approaching God is on particularly clear display in the manner in which the new atheists assess the traditional arguments for God's existence. Both Hitchens and Dawkins dismissed Thomas Weiss's arguments in favor of a first mover or uncaused cause with the cavalier question, well, then what caused God? The observation proves, of course, that neither thinker has grasped the nettle of Thomas's arguments, but for our present purposes, it shows that both persist in thinking of God as one more cause in a chain of contingent causes. We see it as well in their preoccupation with, quote, the God of the gaps. You know that problem. We see it all the time in the New Atheist conversation. All the new atheists revel in what they take to be religion's instinctive but pathetic retreat into the gaps in present uh, scientific accounts of reality. With some justification, they characterize intelligent design theory as just this sort of illegitimate move, and they're right about that, I think. Because we can't discern a clear and uninterrupted path by which certain living forms today evolve from lower forms, we assert God did it, God must have intervened. But what will happen to God so construed as the fossil gap closes, or as our imaginations enable us to picture the evolutionary process more exactly? That's the complaint here. Dawkins laments the fact that while scientists try to clear up mystification, theologians seem to exult in it, playing temporarily in the darkness that science will eventually illumine. Once more, God is being thought of here as a competing cause ontologically at the same level as conventional, empirically verifiable causes. Now, the new atheists are far from reluctant to extrapolate from this metaphysical conception of God to what they take to be deeply disturbing implications for human flourishing. Representing, as they do, a supreme being, competitive with other causes, and brooding over the human project, the religions foster a, quote, this is Hitchens, quote, police state, in which all aspects of private and public life must be submitted to a permanent higher supervision. God watches and governs the world from the outside and imposes his rules on a recalcitrant human freedom. Hitchin seems to accept Sartre's famous syllogism to the effect that if God exists, I cannot be free. But I am free. Therefore, God does not exist. This explains, Hitchens believes, why religion and political totalitarianism are usually closely aligned. Okay, there's the new atheist uh, position on God. 
which I think is a beautiful example of idolatry, or where I would say with Herbert McKay, I completely agree with you in dismissing that kind of God. I maintain that the exertions of a new atheist in regard to God are, for the most part, an exercise in knocking down a not very impressive straw God. A God who dwells in or alongside of the cosmos, who existence, whose existence or non-existence could be determined through scientific investigation, who might himself be susceptible of causal influence, who bears even the slightest resemblance to the flying spaghetti monster, and who presides over the human project in the manner of Kim Jong-il presiding over North Korea, is indeed an idol of the worst type. And it's Thomas Aquinas who can help us to see this. Now I turn uh, with relief to Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> One of the most remarkable features of Thomas's doctrine of God is its agnosticism. In the prologue to question three in the first part of the Summa Theologiae, which deals with the divine simplicity, Thomas famously comments, I'm quoting them, since we are not able to know what God is, only what God is not, we are not able to consider in regard to God how he is, but rather how he is not. Though we say many things about God, we're not entirely sure what we mean when we say them. There's that healthy agnosticism in Catholic theology. The Fourth Council of the Lateran taught that in regard to our speech concerning God, in tanta similitudine maior dissimilitudo, in however great a similitude, there's an ever greater dissimilitude. Thomas picked up on this in making his distinction between the res significata and the modus significandi, the thing signified and the mode of signifying. I can signify things truly of God, but the mode of signifying in regard to God is radically different than the mode of signifying in regard to creatures. This is why Thomas prefers the negative path when speaking of God, taking away from the concept of God whatever belongs to creatureliness. Though, for instance, we can speak positively enough of God's goodness, we don't really know what we mean when we use the term. To say that God is eternal is tantamount to saying he's not in time. To say he's immutable is tantamount to saying he doesn't change in the creaturely manner. To say he's a spirit is to say he's not marked by matter. But what any of these terms signal positively remains quite mysterious. What precisely does it mean to be outside of time? I submit no one here below can possibly know. So tied are we to time. What precisely is it like not to be material? No one whose mind and senses are orders to the realm of physical things can ever really grasp. The parables of Jesus, by the way, can be read under this rubric. We say quite correctly that God is just. But in the light of the parable of the vineyard owner who pays the same wage to those hired at different times of the day, we find our conventional view of justice confounded. We say quite correctly that God is compassionate, but in the light of the parable of the prodigal son, we realize the inadequacy of even our most generous interpretation of compassion. Now, if we press this question, Wondering precisely why the God of the Bible remains so mysterious, so resistant to description and nomination. Truly, O God of Israel, you are a hidden God, we hear in the scriptures. The answer lies in the opening line of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Because God brought the whole of the finite universe into existence, God cannot be ingredient within the universe. He must be other in a way that transcends any and all modes of otherness discoverable within creation. Spatial distance, modal diversity, differences in grade, degree, kind, species, variations in speed, temperature, or density, none of these can begin to indicate the radicality of the difference that obtains between God and anything that God has made. In Catherine Tanner's language, the great University of Chicago theologian, God is not simply other. God is otherly other. You and I are other right now, but we can't use that type of comparison with the creation of God. 
To put it still another way, God's transcendence must be construed in such a manner that it precludes the possibility of contrast in the ordinary acceptance of that term. Nicholas of Cusa caught this when he commented that God, though radically not the world, still must be seen as the non aliud as the non-other. All of this is why Thomas typically refers to God not as en sumum, the highest being, but rather as ipsum esse subsistence, the sheer act of to be itself. If God were the highest being, then he could, in principle, be categorized alongside of other beings. Ipsum esse, however, to be itself, is not the most powerful and impressive instance of the genus being. In fact, Thomas specifies that God cannot be placed in any genus, even in the genus of being. One of those breathtaking, laconic remarks you find all through Thomas Aquinas. God can't be placed in any category even the category of being. Hmm, well then, what is he? Good question. He is, but not in the manner that creatures are. Just the contrary, creatures are analogs of God's essentially mysterious modality of existence. The technical term that Aquinas typically uses to signal this unique quality of the divine manner of being is simplicitas. Simplicity. By this he means, as you know, that in God there is no distinction between essence and existence, a distinction which, perforce, obtains in anything that God has made. To be a desk is to be a type of being, namely, that which is constrained by the essential properties of deskness. To be human is to be none other than a human being, an existent delimited by the form or essence of humanity. In both cases, the act of being, the actus ascendi in Thomas' language, is, as it were, poured into the receptacle of a particularizing essence, and hence the things in question are to that degree metaphysically complex. But in God, the source of all existence, there is no such distinction. God is not this kind of being rather than that. He's not in this category rather than that. He's not great rather than small. He can't be placed, positioned, or indicated. In the strictest sense of the term, he can't be defined, since definition necessarily implies delimitation. I'll quote the great Notre Dame theologian David Burrell. To be God is to be to be. He could certainly not fit into any of the gaps in a conventional scientific account of things. Nothing would thingify God more than that move. They don't have to worry about that. We now see why Thomas so consistently correlated the divine simplicity to the self-designation of Yahweh in Exodus 3.14. Moses was asking a commonsensical question. He was assuming, if you want, the mode of the scientist. Which God are you? What kind of being am I dealing with? God's answer, I am who I am, might be interpreted as off-putting. Stop asking me such silly questions. But Thomas reads it as darkly illuminating. My existence, who I am, is identical to my essence, what I am. And this is precisely why Yahweh told Moses that his servant should take off his shoes, for he was standing on holy ground. What does holy mean but set apart, different, other, otherly other? The God who's speaking with that uh, language is not a God who's a being in the world, not a cause ingredient within the world. What becomes abundantly clear now, I hope, in this discussion is that the simple God is, pace ditchkins, never reducible to the level of a creaturely nature. He could never, even in principle, become the object of an empirical scientific investigation. He could never be defined or categorized by an inquiring mind. He's about as far from a flying spaghetti monster or an orbiting teapot as it's metaphysically possible to be. There's a passage in Merton's great seven-story mountain that comes to mind here. Merton read, almost by accident, Etienne Gilson's great book, The Spirit of Medieval Philosophy. 
in which this subtle philosophical doctrine of the simple God is laid out, Merton, as you remember from that passage, was stunned. For he had always considered God to be, and how, how a parallel this is to the new atheists, he always thought God, quote, to be a noisy mythological being. And never imagined that the Christian understanding of God could be presented in such a philosophically subtle way. It seems to me that young and Merton, who believed in the noisy mythological God, had a good deal in common with the new atheists. Now some reflection on Thomas's view of God as creator. It is only this simple God who can, in the proper sense of the term, create, since creation designates the act of giving rise to finite being ex nihilo, right, out of nothing. That creation is a pivotal idea for Thomas Aquinas is evident throughout his writings. G.K. Chesterton caught this when he commented that Aquinas should bear the title Thomas of the Creator. Seems to be quite right. Getting right the absolutely unique way that the simple God relates to what he's made will go a long way to clearing up the pseudo-problems raised by Hitchens, Dawkins, and company. Thomas's most thorough and technical treatment of creation occurs in question three of the Questio Disputata De Potentia Dei on the power of God, which he composed in the mid-1260s while stationed at Santa Sabina, the Dominican headquarters in Rome. In Article 1 of Question 3, Thomas maintains it must be firmly held, tenendum est firmiter, that God not only can, but does create ex nihilo. His justification for the claim rests upon the intensity of God's actuality. <coughs> Every agent, Thomas says, acts in the measure that it is in act, which is to say, in possession of some perfection of being. Thus, a finite cause, fire, sunlight, a carpenter, produces a finite mode of existence, being secundum quid, determined in this way or that. Another way to state this is to say that a finite cause acts by moving, changing, or further specifying the being of another in some way. But God, who is totally actualized in his being, can affect things not simply through motion or change, but through bringing forth the totality of their being, through creating them ex nihilo. In creating, God does not affect pre-existing reality in some accidental way. Rather, he brings the whole of that reality into being. Thomas insists that creation does not take place in time. Why? Because time itself is a creature. It doesn't occur within the theater provided by space. Why? Because space itself is a creature. There's no matter or energy upon which God acts, since both matter and energy are creatures. As such, creation never appears to the senses, nor can it be measured, nor can it be specified temporally. It's better to speak of creation as a continual act. Thomas speaks of creatio continua, continual creation. As is true in the case of the divine nature, we know that creation is, but not really what it is. The anomalous elusive quality of creation is reiterated in the third article of question three, which raises the issue of the, quote, locale of creation. Where precisely is creation? Is it in the creature? Is it between the creature and God? Where is it? Thomas responds, creation as an act is in God, since whatever God does is identical to what God is. But creation in the creature is much harder to pin down. For we can't say that it's simply received by the creature as an outside influence, since that would presume there's a receptacle that is not itself created. We can only say, and it puts me in mind of a Zen koan, and I'm quoting Thomas here, that God creates that which is receiving the act of creation. Figure that one out. Discuss that among yourselves. Hence, creation is, quote, a kind of relationship to the Creator with freshness of being. It's a lovely line in Thomas. It's quidam relatio ad creatorum cum novitate ascendi. It's a kind of relation to the Creator 
with freshness or newness of being. God is responsible, in short, for the entirety of a creature's being. Yet, and this is the key, I think, his influence is not external to the creature. And that's why he speaks of it as a kind of relation. You and I are related to each other right now, but in sort of an extrinsic way. I'm in front of you, you're in front of me, I'm speaking to you, you're listening. We have these relations, but they're extrinsic to us. See, Thomas is well acquainted with the Aristotelian notion of relationship as an accidental qualification of two or more substances. But he knew that creation, which is responsible for the whole of a creature's being, cannot be imagined as between the creature and God. As he does when speaking of the Eucharist, Thomas here uses Aristotelian language, but in a decidedly non-Aristotelian way, signaling that something else, metaphysically speaking, is going on here. God is properly discovered as the deepest ground of a creature's own ontological identity. And see, I'm trying to draw together everything I've been saying about God's simplicity, about God not being a being in the world, now the way God relates to creation, not uh, outsider to another, but rather God, through his creative act, is at the very ground of a creature's ontological identity. Thomas Merton was entirely in a Thomist frame of mind when he said, the contemplative prayer is, quote, finding that place in you where you are here and now being created by God. It's a splendid definition of prayer, deeply Thomist in inspiration. When you pray, you find a place in you where you are here and now being created by God. This clarification, I think, is of enormous importance as a preliminary response to the atheist contention that the human rapport with God can only be one of submission to a tyrant. The creator is certainly other than the creature, yet his otherness is congruent with his absolute closeness to the creature. You see now why Nicholas of Cusa called God the non-aliot, the non-other. Thomas holds that the transcendent God, the other God, is, quote, in all things, by essence, presence, and power, and most intimately so, in all things, by essence, presence, and power. An invader from the outside, no, no, the one who's here and now giving rise to my being from the inside. His lordship over creation is simultaneously the most gentle letting be of creation. Creatures don't so much have a relationship to God. They are relationships to God. This is why Meister Eckhart, the great medieval mystic, who sat in Thomas's chair of theology just a generation after him, said that the best way to find God is to sink into God. Not so much climbing the whole to a distant being, but to sink into God. John Milbank, a contemporary theologian, and others in recent years have drawn out a most important feature of this teaching, namely, that creation from nothing is an essentially non-violent act. In most of the mythologies of the ancient world, creation takes place through a primordial act of violence, God or the gods wrestling some enemy or opponent into submission. The philosophical accounts of Plato and Aristotle and others represent a more sophisticated version of this myth in the measure that they picture a divine figure, the demiurgos in Plato, the prime mover in Aristotle, shaping matter into form invasively shaping something that stands outside of them. But there's none of this in the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo. God cannot, even in principle, wrestle some alien and recalcitrant opponent into submission or shape it from the outside in an intervening way. Why? Because the very existence of that thing is itself the result of creation. God makes from nothing. He wrestles nothing, intervenes in nothing as he makes the world. Rather, he brings the whole of finite reality into being non-violently. The biblical narrative here is quite telling. God doesn't fight the world into existence. God speaks the world into existence. 
Another question that can be explored under the rubric of the divine creativity is this. Why precisely does God create at all? If, as Thomas insists, God in his perfection is utterly self-sufficient, why would God feel obligated to give rise to finite being? One way classically to solve this problem is to dissolve it and say that God creates because he has to. The medieval Arabic philosopher Avicenna, for example, argued that creation is a kind of automatic emanation from God. In saying this, he anticipated by eight centuries the dialectical theology of Hegel, and by nine centuries the process theology of Whitehead and his disciples. But with this sort of emanationism, Aquinas has no truck. While natural causes that act through necessity are determined toward the production of one kind of effect, think of a plant that gives rise predictably to seed after seed, causes that act through intelligence and will produce a wide variety of effects. Think now of Picasso or James Joyce. God's production, obviously, is wild in its fecundity and diversity, and thus it follows for Thomas that God's mode of creativity is not automatic, but intelligent, purposive, and artistic. That's a master metaphor for Thomas, by the way. God the artist. Thus, God chooses with artistic intent to give rise to the universe, but he does so in utter freedom from self-interest. And this implies that God's creative act is a gesture of love. For love is the willing of the good of the other as other. Since God has no ontological need, any and all of his actions on extra are for the good of the other. Therefore, by conclusion, the world has been spoken into being non-violently and lovingly. In response to certain Hegelianizing tendencies in the theology of the 19th century, the First Vatican Council reiterated this point, stating that God creates not out of any sort of need, but simply out of a desire to share the divine goodness and glory. Here again, we see how far this Thomistic sense of God is from the character proposed by the new atheists. The creature's relation to the creator God is not crushing and oppressive. Instead, it's the very act by which the creature subsists. More to it, this act is fundamentally non-violent, non-intrusive, non-aggressive, and is done out of the sheerest love. That's the way the creator God has to relate to the world of creation. Now, having sketched Aquinas' treatment of the divine simplicity and creativity, I'd like to examine, however inadequately, one more major motif in Thomas's doctrine of God, namely his teaching concerning the relationship between divine causality and creaturely causality. The problem is a vexing one and much hangs upon its resolution. As we clearly see in the New Atheists, the modern mind reacts against any claim that God interferes with the movements of nature or the movements of the human intellect and will. The objection is theoretical, don't the natural sciences and psychology adequately account for these phenomena, but it's also existential. A competing supernatural cause is an intolerable affront to finite freedom. What I've been exploring more abstractly now becomes focused and concrete. How exactly does the non-competitiveness of God play itself out in terms of specific interior and exterior events? I first observed that Thomas speaks of God as both creator, the one who gives rise to the whole of the universe from nothing, and as a mover, one who directs particular creatures and creation as a whole to their appointed ends. And he sees no contradiction or tension between the two characterizations. God affects creatures at the deepest possible level of their existence, and in relatively secondary ways as well. Now, when God moves or otherwise affects a creature, he's not strictly speaking creating, but, this is key for Thomas, he never ceases to be the creator. And this means that the non-competitiveness that obtains in regard to the unique act of creation holds analogously in regard to less dramatic instances of divine influence. 
Thomas explores this matter in detail in the seventh article of the famous Question 3 of the De Potentia. The topic for discussion is whether God operates in the operations of nature. The dilemma should be clear. If God is the creator of the entire universe in every detail, what room is left for the free exercise of creaturely agency? Wouldn't the presence of the creator simply absorb any purposeful causality outside of himself? The said contra to this article could function as the light motif of my entire discussion of the God-world relationship. Quote, this is from Isaiah. O Lord, it is you who have accomplished all that we have done. It's Isaiah 26, 12. O Lord, it is you who have accomplished all that we have done. Well, there it is, stated clearly and unapologetically. The dimensions of created and uncreated causality placed side by side. We have really done certain things, and yet they've been accomplished in us by God. This sort of juxtaposition is possible only on the assumption that God and creatures are not competing for space on the same metaphysical playing field. The high paradox, once more, is that the very strangeness and otherness of God is what allows for God's close cooperation with finite agency. In the course of his response, Thomas lays out a number of models for understanding the synergy between divine and non-divine causality. I'll look at only one. One thing he says can operate in another in the measure that the former provides the latter with its virtus or power, as say when the sun influences a solar heating device. Now God certainly acts in this way, since as creator he's continually providing not only power but being to all his creatures. He's the condition for the possibility of their being and acting in the first place. But Thomas adds this, it's very interesting, quote, The higher the cause, the more common and efficacious, and the more efficacious, the more profoundly it can penetrate into the effect. Close quote. A finite cause can influence another finite cause. But the infinite creator, who is the sheer act of to be itself, can penetrate utterly the effect, acting thoroughly but non-obtrusively in the agency of that effect. With this clarification, we come, I think, to the heart of the matter. In our ordinary experience of instrumental causality, the using cause invades the being of that which it uses from the outside. But God precisely as the creative cause of all that exists, can use finite causes instrumentally, but non-invasively. Of course, the most interesting instance of this dynamic, at least from our perspective, is the manner in which God works in and through the moves of the human free will. Aquinas is convinced that God moves human wills in such a way as to achieve God's purpose, and that this providential direction in no way compromises human freedom and integrity. This is the case. Why? Why? Because God doesn't push or pull human wills from the outside as much as he energizes them from the inside. Freedom is not unmitigated spontaneity, but the ordered pursuit of the good in accord with the deepest desire of the free subject. Where is God operating? precisely there, at that deepest ground of my own interiority. It is you, Lord, who therefore have accomplished all that I have done. You, Lord, are so utterly other that you can be involved in me most intimately, but non-invasively, non-competitively. That's what Thomas is arguing over and again. The otherly other God can operate at the level of the ground of the will, luring it in accord with its own most nature, and hence can enable the human subject to be itself precisely through surrender. I find it fascinating how this non-competitive play is consistently displayed in the biblical narratives. Yahweh acts in human affairs, but not typically in an interruptive way. Rather, he accomplishes his purposes through the play of human freedom. The narratives concerning David are particularly instructive here. 
There's very little of the explicitly supernatural in those stories, if you notice. Yet Yahweh is clearly presented as achieving what he wants, as acting throughout the stories. That achievement takes place in the densely textured political and psychological drama involving Hannah, Eli, Samuel, Saul, Jonathan, David, and so many others. The story is, on one level, completely understandable in political and psychological terms. Yet, the author of the Samuel Cycle wants us to penetrate to the deeper level of non-competitive divine agency. Because the highest cause is not a being among many, it can operate in the realm of beings non-violently. Or as the Book of Wisdom has it, sweetly. We hear there that God's power stretches from end to end of the universe mightily and orders all things sweetly. Not violently, invasively, interruptively, but sweetly from the inside, so to speak. We see again here how the atheist concerns about the God of the gaps who tyrannizes the human project from without are, at least from the perspective of Thomas Aquinas, completely misplaced. Just a quick word before I close about how we got to the space where Hitchens and Dawkins and company can be so insistent that religion's a problem. How do we get from this beautiful theology of Thomas Aquinas to their complaint? One might be forgiven for wondering how things got so confused. How exactly did we get from Thomas's subtle metaphysics of divine simplicity and non-competition to the overwrought and misplaced preoccupations of the new atheists? A good deal of the blame can be assigned, I think, to um, William of Ockham and the option for a univocal over an analogical conception of being. I apologize to any Franciscan uh, philosophers in the room. Um, within the confines of this very brief presentation, I can hardly do justice to the complexity of that uh, very important shift. But suffice to say that once Ockham and his colleagues had posited being as a univocal term, God and creatures had to be categorized under the same general metaphysical heading as modalities of being. Though he was supreme, infinite, all-powerful, etc., God, on the alchemist reading, was one reality alongside of others, and hence, competitive with them. On Aquinas' reading, all creaturely things were linked to one another through their shared centeredness in the creative ground of existence. But on the Occam interpretation, the totality of being is made up of mutually exclusive and unconnected individuals. He famously says, Praetor illus partis absolutas nulla rens. Outside of these absolute parts, there is no real thing. Now there's the individualism that we see haunting much of modernity. You don't find that in Thomas's metaphysics. As the late medieval world gave way to the modern, this conception of the God-world relationship became solidified, I'd say unhappily. Even as God was affirmed by modern philosophers from Descartes to Leibniz to Thomas Jefferson, he was more and more imagined as a distant being who had a mechanistic relationship to natural causes and an interruptive relationship to human freedom. But the ever more precise specification of the physical forces involved in cosmic movement conduced toward an ever more abstract and distant view of God. And the ever greater assertion of human freedom conduced first toward the marginalization of God and finally to his elimination. Commencing with Feuerbach, atheist philosophers began to say that the no to God is the yes to the human. See the competition just implicit in that remark. It's a zero-sum game. To say no to God is to say yes to us. Thomas Aquinas would have no truck with that. This trajectory reached finally toward Sartre's famous syllogism, to which I alluded above. It is only the competitive supreme being, the unhappy offspring of the univocal conception of being, that could possibly be the object of this kind of contempt. The God articulated by Thomas Aquinas is a competitor neither to the mechanistic causes named to the physical sciences, nor to a robustly functioning human freedom. Rather, he's the one whose glory, in the words of St. Irenaeus, is a human being fully alive and by extension, a cosmos operating according to its own principles, laws, and rhythms. That's the glory of God. His glory is not the suppression of this world, the suppression of our freedom. His glory is precisely the elevation of it. And his non-competitive transcendence makes that paradox uh, 
Incredible. Okay, just a few paragraphs of conclusion, and I promise I'll stop. Through my wrestling with the new atheists in both uh, academic and more popular contexts, I've become convinced that the Catholic Church in the years following Vatican II, the years I was coming of age, has been rather inept at presenting its own textured and intellectually satisfying understanding of God. See, part of the problem is we've been bad, it seems to me, we Catholics, at articulating what we mean by God. As I've tried to demonstrate in this paper, the contemporary atheists are doing battle essentially with caricatures. And therefore, it's altogether right to say to them with Herbert McKay, you're absolutely right. But this is not enough. We have to get much better at giving reason for the hope that is within us, as Peter said. We have to get much more adept at articulating our belief in the simple God, whose otherness is enhancing to the world rather than competitive with it. We have to formulate, I think, a new fundamental apologetics. When I was coming of age in the years after the Council, apologetics had a very bad name. It was defensive, rationalistic, unbiblical, and above all, disrespectful of other religions. Furthermore, my post-conciliar teachers and formators were enthusiastic advocates of a positive engagement with the environing secular culture, even going so far as to suggest, according to a famous slogan of the time, that the world sets the agenda for the church. It's a really bad slogan. <laughs> All this was exaggerated and one-sided. Every culture, very much including our own, is evangelically ambiguous. That is to say, to some degree, amenable to the proclamation of the gospel, and to some degree, quite inhospitable to it. Simply to pursue a culture and seek accommodation with it is therefore never a healthy evangelizing strategy. My own conviction is that during these years when the church was running after the secular culture, that culture was not the least bit eager to reciprocate. Instead, it went about its business, more or less indifferent to the church, which was ardently pitching woo in its direction. And then in the wake of September 11th, I think a lot of the new atheism is a post-September 11th phenomenon, a significant portion of the secular world, led by Ditchkins and company, turned rather aggressively against religion in general, but Christianity in particular. And when they did so, here's my, my concern, when they did so, we found ourselves rather ill-equipped to defend ourselves, having long jettisoned our evangelical and apologetic tools. Ironically, I think it's the pre-modern doctrine of Thomas Aquinas, in all its riches and complexity, that provides perhaps the surest foundation for this new evangelical apologetics in the postmodern world. And thanks for listening tonight.